So my name is Milo Kelly from DPI's Agricultural Land Use Planning Team. All right, so welcome to our fourth forum in the Paddock to Planning series, not counting our uh, industry webinars, that is. Our topic for today, as you know, is data options and consultation for rural land strategies. And it follows on somewhat from our last forum way back in May on strategic planning for agriculture. While the main intention here is to help you approach the investigation phases of rural land strategies and other strategic planning efforts in rural areas, we also hope it's going to be useful or at least interesting for those of you who do something along the lines of DA or environmental management or similar roles. We'll begin with a quick acknowledgement of country. Um, the Department of Regional New South Wales acknowledges that it stands on country which always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters and we show our respect to Elders past, present and emerging. We're committed to providing places in which Aboriginal people are included socially, culturally and economically through thoughtful and collaborative approaches to our work, which is very relevant to the consultation component of uh, today's forum. So some housekeeping briefly, this session is being recorded. So please stay on mute throughout and turn off your camera, assuming you don't want to be included. You'll be turning them back on, of course, for the breakout rooms if you stick around, which will not be recorded. So if you have any questions for us or the presenters, put them in the chat, please, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end. If not, we're going to follow up with some responses after the event. And we'll also provide everyone's contact details in case you need anything else from us. And if you have any broader comments, you can post them on our paddock to planning ideas wall. The link to that should be in the chat, though I might need to get someone to add it now. Um, the outline of today's forum, the topic is the, of course, the investigation phases of strategic agricultural planning, and that's quite broad. So the way you're going to go about it will be very dependent on your specific needs and context. Because of that, we haven't attempted to come up with like a comprehensive how-to guide. And instead, we've brought in a selection of short prezos from different professionals working across this space, which I hope will give you some insight and inspiration. First, however, me and my colleague Helen will be providing an overview of the topic and of some different options for uh, undertaking desktop review of agriculture in your area. This will include a preview of our soon to be released AgTrack Agricultural Spatial Data Site. Then of our guest presenters, we're going to hear first from Dr. Kieran Moffat of the Engagement Consultancy for Koenig, who's going to be describing the importance of building trust and social license in consultation projects. And we're then going to hear from our Rural Recovery Officer, Henry Goodall, about his experiences engaging with rural populations who've been uh, in dire straits following natural disasters. Finally, to wrap it up with a council perspective, we've got Stephen Timms, a strategic planner at Clarence Valley Council who's going to be describing their experience, bringing these elements together in investigating their rural land strategy. It's a pretty action-packed webinar, but we're going to be doing our best to get to your questions afterwards in a Q&A before we head out to our breakout room sessions for the following half hour. The breakout rooms are optional, but we really encourage you to stick around, um, particular for, particularly for council staff who have or will soon undertake a rural land strategy or just have an interest in the area. I'll now hand over to myself and Helen. Um, now, without repeating the contents of the previous forum, I'm just going to provide a very high level overview of the what's and the why's to give a bit of a framework for the talks to come. So data gathering and consultation exercises should be the groundwork for creating a strong rural land strategy or similar project. And so it's important to bring it back to the objectives of that project. Your specific objectives might vary, but we've got a few examples on the screen which we think will cover the important elements, which is about recognising uh, the diverse economic and non-economic values associated with agriculture and other rural land uses, improving the integrity and the sustainability of agriculture, and recognising and responding to pressures on it. If those are the objectives, then what are the key questions we're trying to find out to achieve them? First, what's around, and this is going to be your agricultural resources, starting with land and soil mapping, the industries themselves, and the communities behind and around them. Naturally, these communities can be very diverse with different values and interests, but uh, this also goes for the industries too, because there's a lot of smaller niche industries that might not have the same level of 
um, conspicuency or representation as the larger ones, but they're nonetheless important. Then the where it is and why, which is uh, looking at the industries in particular here, this might be related to biophysical characteristics, but it might also be factors like proximity to markets and local processes. Beyond the practical concerns, industries might also be there just as a matter of the history of the area and its communities, which is uh, obviously something very important too. Again, still looking at the industries themselves, you want to understand what its spatial needs are going to be. And this can include the buffers, either the formal ones or the de facto ones, to reduce land use conflict from noise, from smell and other impacts, as well as biosecurity needs. And it might also include functional concerns like access, for example, you know, what kind of road networks need to be around, where are they going, how heavily used or noisy are they going to be. And finally, you're going to want to be considering the trends, opportunities and challenges faced by these industries, resources and communities. And this will include things like growth and decline of industries, but also demographics, uh, land use conflict, innovations, particularly the ones which concern spatial changes or infrastructure, and increasingly important is climate change. The innovations and changing practices, uh, particularly the ones in response to climate change, are not always assured in terms of their viability, their rate of uptake or their acceptance. So it's really important that you kind of get boots on the ground and talk to the people who are supposed to be implementing them and see how they're considering them. I'll pass over now to Helen, who's going to give a bit of an overview of um, a desktop data sources you might want to investigate. Thanks, Milo. Yeah, and, and just leading on from um, what we mentioned before about the importance of that information for rural land strategies, there's also many other areas that we can use this information. So looking at your LSPSs, um, and just as important in housing strategies and, and community strategic plans, and uh, also when reviewing or preparing uh, land use con uh, conflict risk assessments. So um, the, the, this data can be uh, used in many areas across council's roles. So jumping out uh, there into what information is currently out and available. So from a mapping point of view, uh, one of the most important parts is to use a map for its intended purposes. There are quite a few out there. Uh, we do have a guideline, and we'll share the links later on, uh, about some of those maps that are there and, and what are the best uses for them. So um, as you might be aware, we've got the uh, preliminary draft state significant ag land map uh, that's that's out there. We've got land and soil capability, uh, BSAL. Uh, so it has some limitations with its use. And there's also other um, sources from UNE. So those that were on the horticulture webinar uh, last month uh, would have seen the Australian Protected Cropping Map. And of course, the land use map um, from A Clump as well. So, just highlighting though that this is really about um, more so the, the the land, so linked to the biophysical. So it doesn't quite pick up those industries that are not as reliant on things like climate and slope. Um, so things like the poultry industry. When it comes to information uh, about the your backyard area, so uh, some of you are familiar with the snapshots that we put together. So this was this is like a uh, a little document for each subregion. Um, so there's about 19 subregions across the state, and they're put together based on the different, I guess, commodities in those areas. And it gives a really good overview of not only the industries that are key to those areas, but um, some of the opportunities and challenges uh, for the, the area and some of the planning ideas or, or levers to help plan for those particular industries. We're currently undergoing a project to update that with the latest ABS data as well. Uh, DPI also has its performance data and insights page, and that looks at sort of that, that regional and industry um, focus. There's also a lot of uh, industry specific web pages as well. So uh, example was uh, the Horticulture Innovations webpage that gave some uh, details on particular um, hort industries. And also, as Marla said, we've got the, the launch of AgTrack. So I uh, do apologize at the moment DPI is currently going through a web page update. We will share the link as soon as we get it. But I'll just take you through a quick walk through uh, this, this new dashboard that we've got. So I'll just uh, share another screen with you.
So the idea behind this new dashboard is that it gives councils a bit of a better insight into what's happening in their backyard. Um, there is the, so the data has predominantly come from ADS, uh, and there's a lot of data there. So the idea is to really summarise that down and and help explain that the key industries in your area. So first of all, you start with this regional page. So you can look at it um, depending on the planning industry, if you like, or the local government. So we have a guest speaker here today from the Clarence Valley. So uh, we've chosen the Clarence Valley to have a look around. You can also um, just search here or just put in an address and it can help find it for you. So this is a really good opening uh, summary of the area and it gives a, a, a good indication of um, the, the value and, and also the employment and just how much land is actually used for agriculture um, it, within that LGA. And we've added this little diversity one, sort of just to give an idea of just how many different agriculture industries are in that area. We, we come down here, it sort of gives an overview of where that particular LGA fits in amongst the uh, planning region. So obviously Coffs Harbour for the North Coast is big brother, but uh, Clarence Valley certainly is, um, is quite important for that area. Sections four and five are very similar. Uh, it, it looks at where the particular LGA is ranked across the, the state for different commodities. Uh, so obviously sugar cane's a very big one up in that area and it's the second highest LGA for, um, for that commodity and in value. And then here we, we move into the production side of things. This is one I think where it gets quite exciting. It's the section where it really jumps in and, and dives into the, the LGA or the planning region itself. So we didn't want to just focus on what's only the top five. We wanted to make sure that we could see where that diversity is. So um, you'll, I'm sure you'll get a chance to, to in, jump around and, and play around with that, but it's very um, interactive. You can see if you want to just go into the, the top commodities or if you're only interested in fruit and nuts, you can just click on there and it'll break that down to as well. Obviously reset, just click anywhere on the outside. Next section here is a really good overview of, of the number of businesses and that's broken down and um, the areas for a lot of these commodities. But this one here is, is really important, I think. It's, it not only shows the breakdown of uh, ag employment in the agriculture industry, but in the secondary industries from, from that. So obviously, uh, timber is a really big industry for the Clarence Valley as well, and naturally, sugar um, manufacturing is also a, a prime employment there as well. And then we come into the land use side of things. Uh, just quickly, uh, there's just links down to, to get back to the snapshots um, and notes about where the sources of information come from. The other element to, to the dashboard too is we've got a state overview. So not only do you have that regional breakdown where you can get into that area, um, we, we can have look across the whole state. So just quickly, I'm just using uh, commodity value as an example here. So even though uh, we have 63 LGAs across the state that are producing eggs, uh, so these are all drop down options you can choose. We can see here that there are four LGAs that are pretty much responsible for over half of the egg production in, um, in the state. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing for us to note because these three, the Mid Coast, Central Coast and Penrith, all have a pretty high um, potential for land use conflict. So it's, it's something to, to consider there. So we'll send the link out as soon as possible. And um, thank you very much to Graham um, and Jan. Graham's um, both of the consultants there here in the Hunter from Spatial Lab and Jan um, on her own. So yeah, done a lot of work to, to get this up and running and we hope you can um, get some value out of it. So I'll pass now back to um, Milo to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And Jan Falding, our consultant, I think is in the room with us today. So some lucky people might be able to quiz her on that in the breakout rooms. Um, yeah, great. We'll hand over to Dr. Kieran Moffat now. Um, just need that screen up, Helen. Yeah. Um, yeah, from Vaconic. So... Uh, who's going to give us a bit of a, a view on the importance of trust and in community consultation through his extensive experience. Are you with us, Kieran? I am. 
Thanks, Milo, and thanks, Helen. Really excellent to be with you all today. Um, so what I'm going to do today is give you a quick snapshot of a, of a few different pieces of our, of our work in Braconic um, uh, at landscape scales, but also um, larger and, and smaller. Um, first up, just to, to really, um, uh, I guess, tell you something that you know uh, very, very well in your, in your roles is that it's, it's really tough um, out there to, um, uh, to engage across large areas where there's so much work um, underway currently. Uh, so these are landscapes that are shared by multiple industries uh, and uh, they're all bringing their, their own needs, their own timelines, um, their own demands of, uh, of, uh, of landholders and residents and communities. Uh, and uh, navigating that, um, that is, is, is pretty challenging. The one thing that we know from, from our work um, in Australia, but also in, in, in more than a dozen countries around the world, is that when communities don't have constructive ways to be heard, they'll find creative ways to influence development, to influence um, those things that are impacting their lives. Um, and at Baconic, what we try and do is to, to provide a constructive channel through which community can engage with those industries, with local government um, and, uh, and other key stakeholders um, in that shared landscape um, space. Thanks, Helen. Um, primarily how we uh, uh, do that is through a, a process called local voices, but this, this slide here really just brings home um, uh, the point and how we, how we tackle it, which is, although this is around a resource industry, that the same uh, issues hold across industries you find, which is that, can invest as much as we like in, in um, the things and um, uh, the infrastructure and uh, the processes that, that all, all sit around uh, the development that's taking place and management of industries that are existing in place. Um, but often what we find is that um, industries and local government and, and others really struggle to, to cut through and understand what it is um, that is the point that communities are seeking. What, what is it they want from those relationships? What is it that in fact drives a social license to operate for, uh, for those industries and companies that, that are occupying that, that landscape? And what you can see at the bottom there is a stylized version of, of, um, of a paper that we published in CSIRO before we spun out to form Baconic in 2019 that really uh, quantitatively pulls apart what a social license is and how it works. Um, and then what we do is to, to then uh, unpack each of those boxes with the questions that we use in surveys to bring the voices of, of communities inside those industries um, and companies operating. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> what you will have noticed in that last slide too is that trust sits very centrally in that relationship between the experiences and expectations of community on one side and their level of acceptance or social license on the other. And that's because trust is really functional in those relationships. It's not a nice fluffy thing to have. It's actually really practical, pragmatic component of relationships. It's the benefit of the doubt when things go wrong, but it's also the space that you need to innovate um, and negotiate between different, different industries. What we can see here though, is, is how we tackle um, the, the process of engagement to bring those voices in in a very, very real way and to, to help um, our customers to, to action those insights um, to build stronger, more productive relationships, to give that constructive channel. Um, and I've actually, uh, rather than use the local voices uh, version of this diagram, I'm using one from the Morton Says project, which I thought um, some of you might be interested to go away and, and had do a bit of research around. So this was the city of Morton Bay, I think here in Queensland, um, uh, enormous um, geography, uh, you know, uh, an enormous population, 400,000 odd square kilometres and 270 odd thousand people living here. And that's, uh, that's a, a growing um, uh, significantly over time. Um, uh, also the recipient of a couple of awards at the recent IAP2 um, uh, conference. <clears throat> and what this process tries to do is to um, survey communities to understand what they think across all of the interaction points and relevant issues that for them. We do that locally, face-to-face um, -face often, but, but also uh, when we're working with local government, like we did here with the city of Morton Bay, um, to, to utilise all the channels that you have into uh, communities to collect that data, understand and report it, help council to understand um, what that data is saying, to interpret it, and to inform the way that they're thinking about um, their tactical approaches, but also strategic planning for a region. It's been very <laughs> successful um, in the city of Moreton Bay. And then, actually, what we do is to repeat the process um, uh, over time. So we use an anchor survey at the beginning, which is very detailed, and, th and then follow up with very light pulse surveys at critical points across time. So maybe six monthly or, or something like that. 
And so that channel of communication is open for people to have a confidential and anonymous voice into um, local government um, that can be used in, in other contexts as well by other industries. And in fact, Mort Morton City, what they do is have a, a version of the dashboard we provide to council available to anybody within the community. So they can use that to be framing up the business case for investment by council in their programs or in their, in their community-based organisation, but also for others, a bit like the departmental um, uh, uh, databases as well, to use for, for anybody um, who has interest in, in understanding how communities fit themselves together and, and how to engage effectively. So this cycle just continues across time as an open uh, conversation. Thank you, next slide. Um, uh, and what we found, uh, I thought I'd come at this in a, in a couple of different ways. So what are the drivers of social license for rural industries, but also for people living in these locations, in these shared landscapes, um, uh, looking back at, at industries. So we do work on both sides of transmission infrastructure and, and generation, but also mining and, and other resources, urban and, um, and other infrastructure development. Um, and here with a project called Community Trust in Rural Industries through AgriFutures, which is a national project looking at the, the community perspectives about rural industries. And these things on the left are the key drivers of trust um, and acceptance in rural industries at a national level. And what we can see here is that across four time points since 2019, that environmental management and sustainability, really key driver of trust in the broader community about rural industries and their social license. Procedural fairness is really fundamental, which is listening effectively to community concerns and taking action based on those concerns. Animal welfare is right up there, but also confidence in regulation. So that's confidence in the rules that are around the way that industries are governed and, and how they govern themselves. And then also distributional fairness. So how fairly the benefits from all of this development are distributed within um, uh, the nation as a whole. Um, and then when we turn around and look at how communities themselves view rural industries, oh, sorry, view um, institutions like local government, we see procedural fairness is also really strong in that relationship. Confidence in regulation, which is about protecting community um, uh, interests um, and ensuring that these industries are operating within a framework that protects those interests. And then also getting a fair share from development like renewable energy, transmission infrastructure and generation, making sure that it's not just cities that are, that are capturing that benefit, but that others in those communities locally are, are seeing that value as well. If we go on to the next slide. Thank you, Helen. It's my uh, second to last slide. Here's a really um, practical way that we've been using those models. So this is uh, a workshop that we ran uh, in Canberra with a bunch of rural industries. And we use those models that I showed you, sort of the boxes and arrows to help shape up how rural industries would respond to a challenging um, um, issue if it, if it came up. We trained on, on a scenario which was around a water theft in a particular industry and how, uh, how that, that industry and others would respond effectively to that using the model. But also then we did a, a similar thing with the grains industry. And when you know it, a couple of weeks after that training, they had a, an overspray incident and used the model to shape up, okay, if we're going to be responding in a public domain to this issue, you know, what do we need, what, what is it that makes our social license tick and how are we framing up our tactical response, our messaging, um, so that we're speaking to the concerns of, of community in a way that our model tells us um, uh, they're going to respond effectively to, what do they want to hear from us effectively, as well as on what issues we need to be demonstrating assurance and mitigation that, that we're addressing um, critical issues in that, in that particular incident. So we take that quite high level work, we break it right down to the, the level of, uh, of, of tactical response on the ground um, and help um, uh, communities, help um, local government and also uh, industries to be thinking effectively about not just you know, how to spin this, how do we, how do we try and um, work to, to mitigate the damage, actually how do we use this as a way to demonstrate they're actually committed to key outcomes that are of value to, to local community and how do we change ourselves so that we, we make sure that we do better next time. Thanks, Helen. My last slide. Um, a, a few key takeaways for me around the, the key concept of social license to operate. It's a really powerful concept. For community, it's about power imbalance and addressing that imbalance through having voice into the conversations that shape their lives. It's about having control and agency 
And it's about making sure their identity is, is preserved and protected um, in the midst of all of this um, transition that's going on um, in lots of different, different industries, as well as making sure we don't lose touch with that very strong rural um, agricultural identity, which is so prevalent um, in lots of the parts of, of your state. Um, for companies, for industries, for local government, it's about control and how do we how do we help kind of maybe relax some of that need for 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 absolute control in the way that we manage issues like this, um, a freedom to operate, to be able to, to to do our work effectively, managing that sense of vulnerability um, uh, and control as well. But really, what one thing I want to leave you with is that the conditions for acceptability for all of those people, institutions, organizations, industries that are operating in this landscape, those conditions for acceptability are negotiated every day through all of the actions by contractors, by, by individuals, by, by um, policy, um, uh, all of those things shape the context for acceptability. And so we need to be tapping into understanding that in a regular, consistent, systematic way, which is what we, we developed in CSIRO and now um, deliver across the globe. Um, and we can measure these things. We can model how they fit together. We can understand um, why people feel the way that they do and then use that to inform actions and outcomes on the ground. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm very happy to take questions later. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for that, Kieran. And yeah, load up any questions in the chat. You might just have to check that it's being sent to everyone. Um, so that's been a nice, uh, from that kind of strategic level that Kieran's presented on conducting community consultation, we're going to hand it over to Henry Goodall from strategy engagement also um, under the title of uh, rural recovery service who, who has a lot of experience negotiating and helping out farming communities in particular on the ground following traumatic events so this should hopefully be a, another very good personal perspective um, to get you get you thinking about how to engage with these communities over to you henry Thanks, Milo, very much. Thanks, Kieran, for that. That was great to hear. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, Henry Goodall is my name. Recovery Officer with the Department of Primary Industries Rec Rural Recovery Support Service. I've been working um, in recovery with primary producers and farmers uh, through bushfires and um, through recent flooding events as well. So that's engaging with them in a in a traumatic, stressful situation where have had damages and impacts to their businesses and their, their farms and in the worst cases, uh, sometimes their homes and tragically, occasionally they've uh, lost family members as well. So fairly stressful, heightened situation there um, that me and the program that I'm working in have been in. Helen, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, just our, our moniker on that previous slide, listen, learn and link, which is what we try and work by. Um, so a couple of things, a uh, few principles and examples, um, sausages and onions, basically food. Um, I get a bit of a hard time from some colleagues who say that the meeting isn't over until Henry mentions the importance of sausages and onions and how they can be a cure for all issues. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about food. Um, if you go anywhere across the the state and the nation sporting events, sale yards, large hardware stores, there's, there's, there's sausages and onion sandwiches. And so from that, the conversation flows, conversation between people, they often discuss the issues that are most important to them. And that's where we kick in and um, really switch on some great, good listening um, and ask some good questions. Um, foods, you know, it's nurturing uh, and people often enjoy the fact that they have to cook dinner when they go home. So if you're conducting an event or engaging with farmers, it's really, really important aspect we find. Um, best example of this is um, uh, in a little valley here near where I live, uh, post about 18 months ago, flooding damage, um, some services, government, um, charities, etc., cetera, uh, set up an assistance point. Uh, there were probably 12 or 14 services, local hall, set up there for a day and we got about four community members who came through. We know that there are about half a dozen uh, dairy farmers in that valley. None of them came. Um, so we pulled back, had a think and adjusted our invitation and included a few key things. We, we called it a dairy farmers 
barbecue brunch. We use the word dairy front and center on the invitation. We put it uh, at a time of day that was really that was really uh, critical, but 9.30 to 11 o'clock there when dairy farmers have finished milking, um, held it at the local showground, which was really adjacent to the local hall where it had been before. Same services, same assistance on offer. Um, all the dairy farmers came to that one, every single dairy farmer in the area, just because they felt valued and they felt considered and they felt understood. They saw them, they saw the word dairy and they're like, oh, right, oh, that's us. And they all came. Um, next slide, please, Helen. Yeah, so if it's a, I love this saying, if it's about me, don't do it without me. Uh, the, the, the message here, I think, is that, um, that there are not just, you know, not just the farmer that's in the community there or in that situation. There's often a family or a partner. There are kids, elderly people um, behind, behind that individual farmer. So, so invite them all. Um, invite everybody. It, it really humanizes the event and gives it a community a community feel that's uh, that's addressing the the issues. Um, it, it it gives a yeah it gives a warmth if you like overall to the organisation to you to the local council to the event itself. There's complexity and diversity in our in our communities, and this can often bring really good. Um, really unexpected outcomes and and relationships going forward uh the yeah it, it's it's really valuable when the farmer or the primary producer or whoever we're engaging with can see the person on the organization as a member of the community before they see the badge that that they're wearing and i often think about these three s's of where we where lots of communities interact sporting events um, at school in the in the bus line um, and at the supermarket. So often the the connection or the engagement can start at those places um, and they might just be a brief conversation and it'll be a follow up with a phone call next week or contact next week that goes to the to the issue. Um, but a caveat there I did have a colleague up up in the north of the state post bushfires, very well connected community member. Everybody already had a personal number before they had a work number. So they were bailing her up in the supermarket. They were ringing outside hours um, and trying to talk issues with her. Um, and she had to put very clear boundaries around personal time and work time. So just a, a warning there. Um, next slide, please, Helen. Uh, so here's another one. Um, Laughter and learning are really essential ingredients of effective engagement and laughter, shortest distance between two people. Uh, a colleague in the New England and Northwest had um, lots of inquiries from farmers and, and primary producers about insurance, fire insurance, flood insurance, um, and what their rights were and the avenues to follow. Uh, traditionally, Apologies to anyone who might be involved in insurance, but traditionally a pretty dry topic, not terribly sexy, hard to pull the crowd. Um, so this colleague of mine, uh, she, she packaged it, if you like. That's the way I like to look at it. She, she offered food. There was a barbecue dinner on. Um, I have no idea where she found a ventriloquist who could provide entertainment and laughter around the insurance topic, but she did. So um, had a ventriloquist there. She obviously had a expert speaker on insurance from the Insurance Council of Australia for the learning section. Uh, and she managed to get between 40 and 60 people to each event in three small towns um, in, in the north of the state. And so provided this extra benefit of social connection as well. So it was a really sort of multi, multiple, um, multi-level engagement event, which was really successful. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. Thank you. Um, so I, yeah, I don't care what you know until I know you care. Uh, I invite people to to have a think about how they show up and um, where they show up and 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 how they connect with with people, whether they launch straight into business or have a little casual icebreaker conversation, find a point of connection at the beginning. Um, I've got a point there about office clothes and farm clothes. Farmers, 
are not as easy going as the, the perception. Um, they're often fairly overworked, overtired, and they can be quite judgmental if you turn up and they'll see the badge on your ute. And you've got about three seconds to, to, you know, to work out whether they're going to give you the time of day or not. Um, so really, I think what they're after is consideration rather than consultation. That's a um, seen as a box ticking exercise. And if you can get to, to farmers and make them feel considered, then that can lead to really true collaboration. Um, there's a potential there for the clash of values with, with farmers, values around how ultimately we value our soil nutrients. Do we put a highway on top of them? Do we put a sporting field there? Or do we, you know, do we grow broccoli on them? Um, so farmers use those values. You know, they, they, they see their farm as a, um, through a food and fibre industry, they, they, they see economic value in their business, but there could be heritage value there in their home that could have been, you know, the farm could have been through multiple generations of their family. And uh, Kieran mentioned there previously about the environment and environmental stewardship being a key driver in, um, in uh, social licence. So farmers use those values in all of their decision making. Um, so I strongly encourage you to think about um, consistency, showing up and showing up regularly wherever farmers are, the camp draft, the rodeo, the local show. And sometimes they won't engage until they've seen you six times. They won't even say good day. Um, and that's where time comes in to be present, keep on arriving. And then once you do, um, ask the good questions and listen to the answers and, and find a point of connection. I mentioned that briefly there before. Best examples of this I can think of are, are my own. Um, early on in bushfire recovery uh, on the south coast, a bit further from where I live, um, south from where I live, there were some farmers that have been completely burnt out. And I was talking to one woman who had lost everything and I launched into the full assistance package of grants and support mechanisms and stuff that I had available to help her and her farm. And um, she let me go for a while, but then quietly reminded me that she, her house had burnt and winter was coming and her kids didn't have any more woolen jumpers. And so, you know, it was, a, it was the most lovely, gentle slap in the face I could have got that reminded me, actually, that's your issue. And we're not going to get anywhere till we address that. So I put her in touch with some charities and, you know, eight months later, I saw her again and she was a little bit more ready to engage with the assistance that I had. Another example was an elderly an elderly farmer who had was very lucky to uh, to not lose his life. Actually, his whole his whole farm was burnt. Um, and but he was quite he was an elderly fellow who was dignified and a community contributor already. He'd won red, white, and blue ribbons with his cattle at Sydney Show. He was a school teacher and a sports referee, uh, and had been a local uh, a local uh, mayor as well. So had a dignity as a community contributor and wasn't used to coming to assistance and asking for assistance. So um, when I got to talking to him, first thing, he was really thankful to be able to talk to another man, you know, because a lot of the people he'd spoken to previously had been, been women um, and he just enjoyed the opportunity to sit down and talk to another fellow. So we would have a cup of tea, piece of fruitcake and never talk about his issue. We talked about everything else. And at the end, I'd have a piece of paper or some information that might be relevant and I'd ring him the following week to follow up. So it was a really non-confrontational, avoiding the issue type engagement. Um, that's about, I think that's about it really. The, um, the next slide there, I think Helen is just a few pretty pictures, but really strongly encourage people to think about their recruitment too and the possibility of recruiting young people with, uh, or any people with agricultural backgrounds because they're accustomed to the hard work and they'll speak the language of, of rural Australia. Um, and ultimately, farmers, like all humans, need to feel as though they've been listened to. So that would be my main points. Listening, recruitment, laughter, invitation. Think about your invitation. And food's a good one. So thanks. Happy to take questions at the end. And there's an email address there if anyone wants to make contact. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Henry. Um, yeah, I, having that really good um, understanding of the specific needs 
of those communities and the conversation styles and the communication styles, once you've identified them, is clearly very, very important. Um, and I guess that goes for farmers or whoever else you might encounter in your area, but that's a really good into, insight into that specific community. We'll pass over now as a way of kind of um, running back over those example, over those talks from a council perspective to Stephen Tim's from Clarence Valley Council. I always get tongue-tied on that, but hopefully Stephen gets Clarence yeah. Valley Council right all the time now. Um who's going to be describing his council's experience doing these data gathering stages for their recent um, and very commendable rural land strategy. So over to you now, Stephen. Thanks, Milo. And yeah, thanks very much for having me. Great that we've got so many people on the line. So we just wanted to um, yeah, run through our experience, I guess, at council. Um, I'm really just reiterating what the previous speakers have been talking about, really the importance of data gathering and that engagement. Um, but just before I lose my train of thought, I just um, struck by Henry's um, presentation just then. Yesterday was um, Town Plan World Town Planning Day, and there's a really good uh, video on the PIA website about planning um, being an attitude. It's really um, just about the approach that you take to that engagement and turning up like you're talking about. But I think I really agree with that and sort of helped in the background with that, um, that planning being an attitude. If you've got the right approach to um, gathering the data, talking to the right people, engaging with government and industry, et cetera, then um, I think that's probably the key takeaway message uh, from all of this. The rest is uh, sort of process, I guess, and um, making sure you, you get the right things together. Um, so, yeah, just briefly, introduction to Clarence Valley, uh, in case people don't know. It's the largest LGA in coastal New South Wales as a result of a whole lot of amalgamation. Uh, a few years ago, 75% um, of the LGA is uh, zoned as rural and, and some environmental or, or previously zoned environmental conservation now that we include as part of the rural land strategy. Um, and the Clarence is, has been a food bowl for thousands of years. You know, um, Yamba in the local Yagel uh, language means plenty of selfish. So, you know, oysters, uh, pippies, you know, think of the famous Yamba prawns um, and a really rich alluvial um River Valley um, that flows around the Clarence and our seven tributaries that flow into the Clarence. Um, so the importance of agriculture, forestry and fishing to both the economy, but also to our culture and, and just the landscape um, and the way people think about the valley. Um, so it can't be underestimated. Um, but council didn't have a, a rural land strategy. We never had um, something sort of very specific about the ag sector about managing rural land. So we really wanted to, to take this opportunity to, to put that at the forefront. And there was some sort of pressures starting to come to bear. Um, a few people agitating for more focus on uh, agriculture particularly, but it's also the forestry and fishing industries. Uh, and look around the state at um, job opportunities, precincts or even next door in, in casino and real focus on beef and and other things and um, some issues cropping up in, in the valley here, particularly around Grafton and other areas. And people are thinking, well, what, what are we doing about it? Um, so that's sort of the, the context, I guess, um, for why we were doing this rural land strategy and, and why it was needed. And particularly that a need for a long-term uh, strategic approach. Uh, so, um, and, and we really wanted to tackle some of the bigger issues as well as the immediate pressures and things that people can see in front of them. And, opportunities to add value to um, to what we're producing in the valley, but also um, big picture things around climate change, around the changes from uh, sugarcane to macadamia across the landscape, um, the, the pressures that were coming to bear on um, logistics and freight and, and new opportunities that arose out of that with uh, the new highway, um, trying to keep our airport viable and a whole lot of other things that uh, sit sort of outside the rural environment all interlinked together. So, that was the main approach. I don't really want to go through every single objective there on the screen, but it was really, as I just said, about focusing in on the opportunities for the rural economy and addressing those issues that we can see north and south of us um, in you know, Byron, Tweed, Ballina, et cetera, and, and Coffs Harbour to the south of us with the land use conflict, uh, real estate prices booming, um, issues around you know tree changes and sea changes moving in, and those big picture issues that I, I talked about too, really about providing a more consistent planning framework and, and clearer 
more directive approach uh, for the council, for the community and, and industry and government as well. Uh, next slide, please. So to do all of that, um, we really wanted to uh, talk to as many people as possible. Um, it's one thing to gather all the, the data and there is amazing data out there as uh, Helen and others just chatted about. Um, and we pulled all that together to have that evidence. But we really wanted to, to talk to the stakeholders um, and everyone that needs to be involved in. And, and what I'd prefer to call, you know, stakeholders and actual partners, um, people who are gonna help implement the strategy going forward uh, that need to be involved. It's one thing to put pen to paper and come up with lots of ideas and lots of future actions, but we need to actually ensure that we can deliver on, on those things and, and council can do what they're promising to do and make sure that we've got that support um, through as early as possible through the whole development of the strategy. Um, Cause then when it comes to actually implementing it, uh, it's, it's gonna be much easier for everyone. So we, we front loaded a lot of that engagement um, with the government agencies in particular. So up here in the Northern region, we had fantastic support from um, Tamara and Paul Garnett, Selena, um, Craig Diss and his team at TPA and, and a few, a lot of other uh, individuals that got involved too. But that was, really um, quite refreshing, I guess. We, we didn't realise just how much government knows and I guess learning from their experience working with other councils too and also really getting that understanding of where state government was going. Things were evolving literally as we were drafting things, so keeping on top of that was really important. Um, but, yeah, they were a huge help um, and actually a, a really good resource that I, I can't recommend highly enough, particularly at the outset. Um, but then we kept on feeding back and... and, um, and the closing the loop with discussions with those guys as well. We also spoke importantly to people from BCD, you know, natural environment issues, transport for New South Wales around freight and logistics, obviously fisheries given the focus here in the valley, and a whole lot of other um, government agencies too. But we also put a lot of focus on um, the main industries in the Clarence, so cane growing, uh, beef producers, etc., fishermen's carp and the timber industry, but also on those smaller producers. Um, and make sure that everyone was was really included in in all of that. Um, some of them don't have, you know, some industries don't have sort of a, a peak body or you know, a key representative uh, within your region. Um, so the beef producers particularly are a bit dispersed, but the stock and station agents, there's a couple of those in town that have their finger to the ground on, on the pulse and um, they also are fully aware of those pressures around real estate and um, tree changes, et cetera. So they were invaluable, but I guess I guess back to that first point around the attitude and being open and um, being welcoming about all of that. And also, as, as Henry and a few others were saying about um, turning up and explaining who you are and, and where you're coming from and that you do care about the industry. It's slightly easier in my case, I guess, given my background and the family you know, interest in farming and I own a fair bit of land as well. So that really helped open up some doors. But that has to be coupled with um, the evidence base and consultants working alongside us, but also um, being open to new ideas and uh, and talking to different sort of uh, industries that are moving into the area um, and, and making sure you can take that balanced approach. So we utilised um, a lot of existing groups that were out there, but obviously made the most of um, social media and websites and, um, and just word of mouth, which we found really, really valuable too. So... We used um, yeah, existing forums that were already uh, in action. So Landcare, Farmers for Climate Action Group were pretty um, voice uh, uh, active. Clarence Valley Food Incorporated, for example, and, and a lot of um, existing environmental groups. So we found a way of getting involved in their um, meetings or other uh, forums that they were organising already. And um, just, yeah, that point that around not turning up and, you know, first words out of your mouth is, well, what do you think about the, what can we change in the local environmental plan or, or, or something, you know. I know that I'm sort of telling you what you, what you already know, but um, it's really important to find common ground, find the issues and then translate that into the planning speak um, rather than going that that's the reason that we're here to talk about a rural land strategy because we want to update our DCP or whatever it is. Um, and then, yeah, I've already talked about the evidence base there on that slide, so we can just jump to the next one. Uh, public exhibition, um, because we front loaded everything and we still needed to go through the formal exhibition process, but 
it made it a lot easier through that whole process and it meant that we got um, a lot of support and a lot of submissions in support. And in fact, the, the vast majority of them were all in support and there were none sort of outright opposing what we were doing. Um, most, well, every, every written submission that came in were really excited that we had actually put that focus on the rural environment and the rural economy um, and were strongly supportive of that and the uh, interventions that we'd proposed particularly on uh, creating a position for a sustainable agriculture officer and really focusing in on the opportunities to add value and a whole range of different actions in there. But having that support from those government agencies goes a really long way, particularly with our councillors. Um, so when you get the final strategy in front of them to, for approval, uh, we actually had councillors that have been involved in the process standing up and speaking on behalf of the, the strategy and how great it was and how, why we needed to implement it, et cetera. Um, we also put a lot of uh, extra emphasis into that exhibition because um, around about the time there were significant floods in this area, um, so not a great time to be engaging with farmers, but fortunately we'd done that in the run-up to producing the draft, so pre-Christmas, um, then they, they had that level of comfort and strong support for what we were doing and didn't see the need to, to put in submissions. But we ran that exhibition extra long, about 10 weeks or so, because we wanted to give everyone a proper opportunity to have their say, be involved and make sure that, as I said, we could have that support for implementing it down the track. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, very briefly, just the, the next steps with that, as I said, the, there's a lot of actions in there that we've dedicated resource to that made sure that that um, was communicated across council and that executive support is there. And then the funding, et cetera, and, and resourcing comes through the operational plan to make sure we can actually do what we, what we want to do. But it's important to point out that um, council isn't responsible for everything as well. Um, you know, the rural industry had been humming along for a while without, you know, council taking a lead on, on various things. So we were also in the role of collaborating or supporting or advocating for things. But also there's a lot of actions in there that gave a bit of a hook to some um, of our local in, um, engagement industries and uh, local people like Landcare, for example, to go and often get grant funding or, or have this strategy sort of in their back pocket to say, this is really important to council. If we work in a collaborative way with council or these various partners that are named, um, can we have some money to do that? And they're, they're finding various um, grant avenues for that too. So it's not just council doing everything. Um, yeah, that's a very brief overview for me. Happy to take any questions. And uh, oh, sorry, I need to mention, um, I don't think I said by name, Locale Consulting that helped us along the way with the evidence-based gathering and um, some of the engagement that are fantastic to work with. And if you've got any questions, my um, email address is there and more than happy to help. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, now, we haven't had any questions come through the chat and apologies if that is uh, a technical issue, but feel free to have a go. And if not, would anyone like to volunteer by way of the putting their hand up using the reactions function? In the meantime, I might just leave. Um, it was very interesting, I guess, um, from both you, Stephen, I think had spoken about um, utilizing staff from um, from the industry and of course Henry spoke about that too but I think a lot of people here might not have that direct experience in agriculture what are your recommendations from any all three of the speakers to um, getting that process going if you don't have that or haven't identified that sort of knowledge within yourself or your team I'll jump in then yeah I guess um, the approach of just reaching out to people, asking around, um, being open about it. Um, not everyone's got all the answers for, for anything. Actually, you can't be across every topic at your council. Um, everyone's dealing with a lot of different issues. So, yeah, ask around. I think if you're in a rural area particularly, there'll be a lot of people at council that are involved in the, in the industry. Um, people that own land, own cattle, you know, whatever it is in the local industry. Um, and now, no, and that, that was a, a starting point for us. We had a couple of councillors that are um, heavily engaged in, in the industry as well, utilising those resources. And um, I know it sounds funny, but almost asking people how they want to be consulted. So at the outset, you know, how do we reach out to these different groups? How do we make sure everyone's covered? Um, 
that's probably the starting point if you haven't got that direct expertise or if you're coming in new to a council, um, that's certainly what a consultant would be doing, um, reaching out, trying to get to as many people as possible and uh, utilising those existing um, groups that can council talk to, but finding new people and new organisations that have moved in as well. Great. Anything to add on that point, um, either Kieran or Henry? Um, yeah, I'll dive in there. Um, my uh, experience or observations on that one probably is that there's there's great resources in uh, older older people um, who might be, you know, they might have handed the farm on to the next generation and still have some zing left in them um, and still want to be involved and feel valued. Um, and so that that level of yeah resources is a really good one to tap into in those older people that have been involved in in agriculture for a long time. And then also the younger end of the age bracket too. A lot of um, a lot of farming units aren't quite big enough to support you know two, three, four kids that might be in one family. Uh, so you've probably got a young person there who's got that growing up on farm. Um, and got a bit of experience there, but isn't necessarily going to go into agriculture um, per se. So there's a possibility there that they might have skills or quals or something that could be used as well. Great one. Uh, Kieran, or else we got another question from the chat. Oh, I think that's been covered. Let's, let's go to another one. Great. Uh, this one was for Stephen. Uh, what's the role of the consultant in your rural land strategy? And is it something you think needs to be outsourced if time is not an issue? Uh, good question. I guess in our experience, um, timing was a bit of an issue. I didn't mention in the speech about um, that we didn't have a lot of strategic planning work that had been done for quite some time. There was a Clarence Valley Settlement Strategy done in 1999, and we were working through uh, after the updating, the, uh, writing the LSPS uh, housing strategy, employment land strategy, uh, green infrastructure strategy, and, and a lot of other things as well going on. Um, so we didn't have a lot of spare time or resource to delve into, I guess, gathering the evidence and really drafting the actual strategy itself. So that's why we put the consultants in, but more time we, we could have for sure. Um, I guess that they were involved right throughout the process, right from the outset. Um, they're experts in engagement as well, um, you know, the IFP2 qualifications, et cetera. Um, we, we, I sort of had that as well, but not not the time to dedicate to putting pen to paper, I suppose, in terms of the engagement process, um, project management plans, all that kind of stuff, so that we're involved in those things. Um, the word of caution about doing it yourself is just to ensure that you reach those other groups that you might not otherwise. Um, it's fine to... Have those contacts in the local farming community, etc. But um, you don't want to miss you know valuable information or um, new innovative sort of um, ways of doing things. And so just to make sure you got all that covered. But there's no particular reason. It will be up to your council um, how you do that. Um, what sort of relationship we've got. What sort of standing council has in the in the um, community as well. All those things kind of come into it. But yeah, certainly would recommend you, you can do it yourself if you've got the time to do it. Um, and and if, especially if you're um, talking pretty regularly with government agencies and making sure that you're ticking the boxes in that respect and finding the right people to talk to, for sure, yeah. Great. Um, one for Helen, I would say. Uh, this is about the dashboard, the AgTrack dashboard. How frequently is it going to be updated? Noting that in some areas like Penrith, um, there's a lot of pressure on rural land, so it, it changes pretty quick. Yeah, well, that's one reason why we wanted to get the, the information out uh, as soon as possible so that people have got the most up-to-date information. So this is uh, the 21 ABS information, and that's where we will get the majority of the data. Um, ABS is... Um, changing the way that they're collecting information. But as soon as they release new data, that's when we, we um, update it. So the, the idea behind the dashboard is um, to give you an understanding of the, the key industries and some of those niche industries in that area where you are, and particularly around the employment. Um, I just want to put a caveat in there about the employment, though, particularly for the um, agriculture rather than the secondary, is that 
it's done on um, a certain point in the year, so it might not pick up the seasonal employment. So that you know, I can't remember the date in August that people do the census. Um, so just noting that it's it shows trends. It'll show uh, pick up the the things that are likely in that area um, to help you give you a guide of your rural land strategy. So um, and where to go to, to to look for further data down the track. But as soon as there is new data, then we'll look to updating the data dashboard as soon as we can. That's great. Thanks. It's really, really helpful to have that um, uh, information that's going to be available at LGA level because it was um, uh, like Stephen, you know, um, uh, when we're doing our rural land strategy, we had to, uh, we engaged a consultant to do some of that um, an initial work, but to have this um, available that will help monitor um, how effectively we're going um, over time too. So very, really appreciate it and thanks for organising. Wonderful. Just that also there too. So it's a really good um, over, overview um, of your LGA and, and quite interactive, but we will have uh, a download. Um, so all the background data will be there. So that those that uh, love a good spreadsheet and, and want get to get amongst it a little bit more, you'll have that option as well. So uh, we'll send the link out uh, later yeah, next week. That'll be out next week, uh, as well as our performance data and insights update for 2023 so we'll send out a link to that too